Hey everyone, glad that you joined our webinar. In this webinar, we welcome two experts in the field of multicolor stat microscopy. They will share tips and tricks from their years of experience using STAT in fixed and in living cells. My name is Yasmin. I'm biologist by training and at Abaria I work as a social media manager. And I'm super excited to be your host for today. Before we start with our speakers, I would like to say that this webinar has been pre-recorded. Nonetheless, you're welcome to ask any question in questions in our chat. At the end of this webinar, our speakers will join again in a live Q&A session. All remaining questions will be answered via email, so don't worry, no question is remaining unanswered. With this, I'm looking forward to an exciting webinar on multicolor stat microscopy. I'm now here with Florian Grimm, our business developer at Aberior. Hi, Florian. Hi, Yasmin. So, uh, tell us a little bit about your role at Aberior. My job at Aberior is to um, finding new partners from the academia as well as from uh, the industry. We benefit from um, their products and our products, so to um, find ways how we can work together uh, to place the new product uh, on the market for, for example, microscopy techniques. Um, yeah, so that's basically um, the main, uh, main description of my, of my job. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that you're one of the first employees at Aberia, so you know the company from the very beginning. Why is it so exciting to work at Aberia? At Aberia they are working uh, so many different people from different mm -hmm. fields very closely together. So we have uh, engineers, physicists, chemists, biologists, and they all work um, uh, to design or to develop, uh, for example, one mm -hmm. very specific product. And um, to see how all these people are finding ways in solving differently uh, a problem, that's very cool to, to uh, see and be involved in, in this um, yeah, whole project. So that's quite cool at a barrier. Yeah. So we at the barrier also enjoy working with you, Florian. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, nice to hear. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so my last question, a little bit unconventional, but uh, tell me what is your favorite fluorescent dye and why? <laughs> well, first of all, all our fluorophores are great, of course. <laughs> but um, now, for me, very personally, uh, the most interesting dyes are the dyes for lifestyle applications. So all the organic dyes, which can like enter the cell, mm -hmm. of, um, because when I uh, did my PhD also at Aberio, um, I was working on those organic dyes. Um, and it's very interesting to see uh, how this um, um, dyes, this technology behind working and um, how the, the flu force will find their target mm -hmm. and stain it very specifically. Um, so for me, all the live dyes are very, very interesting. Or well, the coolest dye, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, is for me this Life 610 because it's performing all the time very well and for stat microscopy it's a, it's a very cool dye. Excellent choice. <laughs> <laughs> so with this we are looking forward to an exciting talk on multicolor stat microscopy. Florian, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I will talk about multicolor stat microscopy in uh, fixed and uh, uh, living cells. And uh, during my talk, I will uh, show you uh, how both companies, so Aberia Instruments uh, with the uh, microscopes uh, and um, Aberia Labels with uh, the probes and dyes are working uh, closely together, offering um, a very good product uh, for super resolution microscopy. So Aberia Instruments um, produces and uh, um, develops um, stat microscopes, for example, so very, very small stat microscopes as well as very um, advanced microscopes uh, for different applications. Newest product is uh, our MinFlux microscopes, um, achieving um, resolutions down to uh, one nanometer. 
And from the fluorescent side, uh, we offer different categories uh, on, on fluofors. So fluofors are star dyes, which are suitable for stat microscopy. The cage dyes, suitable, for example, for a uh, palm and storm. Um, our flux dyes for min flux microscopy and our live dyes for uh, live cell application. I will briefly show you how we can tune our dyes so that we uh, end up with a portfolio of different dyes showing different excitation and uh, emission uh, spectra. So if you uh, look to this very schematical drawing here, that is a um, um, core structure of a, of a rhodamine dye. So a dye which are uh, normally used for microscopy. So when we can add or exchange uh, groups uh, on this core structure, we can also replace uh, atoms inside those core structures to tune the dyes either to the blue uh, shifted region or to the red, red, uh, red shifted region. So as an example, this dye uh, shows a yellow emission. And when we now, for example, add oxygen to the core structure or when we add halogens to the core structure, then we easily shift the spectra into the blue region. Uh, another idea could be to exchange this benzyl ring by a nitrogen and we end up uh, by a blue absorbing dye, but uh, also showing a very uh, long stoke shift of roughly 130 nanometers to end up with a flu for having this orange uh, emission. We can also do the same thing, but uh, in another direction. So exchanging the oxygen in this uh, core structure by a carbon uh, and then create an orange emitting dye. Or we can increase the whole pi system by adding more or increasing the ring system here of our, of our dye. We can also add um, halogens to the benzoyl uh, ring and then um, uh, creating a dye uh, having a red uh, or even infrared uh, emission spectra. So all these dyes in, in combination or can be combined of course for not only uh, single color but also two or multiple uh, color imaging. To do so I will show you um, a pair of fluofors which can be nicely used in, in our uh, STAT systems. First we, we can use for example the star red uh, which has uh, this absorption maxima at roughly 635, so it's easily excitable with a 640 nanometer excitation laser. And in this detection window, you can nicely detect the uh, photons. Um, and this fluofor can be uh, very, very good uh, used with combination with a 775 nanometer STET laser. So as a second color, uh, we normally choose the star orange. So here, uh, this fluofor is, is excitable with a 461 nanometer excitation laser. With a second detection window, uh, we can separate uh, this orange dye from the red dye. Now with our new uh, launched long stock dye, we can now add a third color to it. So that is, for example, very uh, nicely suitable uh, for the Steadicon, for example, so that you have the third excitation laser for uh, the 488 nanometer excitation laser. And uh, you can use the same detection window as you would use for the star orange. Um, and this long stoke dye uh, can be also uh, used uh, with a 775 nanometer stat laser. So with this, you need only uh, three excitation lasers, uh, two detection windows, and just uh, one uh, depletion laser. So here's an example of a fixed uh, cell stained with these three colors. We stain the nuclear pore complex or protein inside the nuclear pore complex with star red, here shown in orange. And uh, then the vimentine structure uh, we stained with star orange, uh, shown here in magenta. And uh, in green, that's the tubulin filaments, uh, which we stained with uh, the long stoke dye star 460L. So uh, just to give you a comparison of a confocal image on the left side and a stat image on the right side, you see the improvement in resolution. And also uh, these three dyes are showing no crosstalk at all. So it's a very cool uh, three color package uh, of dyes. We also can, can use this 460L dye for live cell applications. So this dye can enter a living cell. Um, as well, it's not only suitable for, for fixed cells, but also for living cells. So what you can see here is a living neuron. 
we stain the actin network with this 460L actin probe, or orange. Um, we uh, stain the, the tubulin filaments uh, with a 590 uh, tubulin probe. And uh, in magenta, you can see here the membrane, which uh, was stained with our uh, recently launched direct membrane probe. This stat image, uh, I will zoom in a little bit closer. Here you can see again the comparison of a confocal image uh, and the stat image. And you can see the improvement in this uh, living neuron in, in resolution. And as I said, this combination of blue absorbing long stock dye, an orange dye, and this uh, star red membrane, this infrared dye, uh, is a beautiful package for uh, a three color life cell uh, application. So, um, with the uh, information from the, uh, the, the spectra information, we are quite limited. So, um, additionally uh, to the spectra, we can also use second information, the lifetime of our flu force. So, just by the spectra, we are quite limited, means that we can distinguish the red dyes from the orange dyes, but we are not able to, for example, distinguish these two orange uh, dyes from each other. Adding the lifetime to it makes it quite easy, so we can now distinguish this both orange dyes from each other and uh, these two red dyes from each other. For this, we are using our new uh, feature, which has been released quite re recently, the time bow. So here we are using a phaser plot and by linear separation we can separate the die showing a longer lifetime from the die showing a shorter lifetime. So here's an example of a fixed cell stained with star red and star 635. As I said, the emission spectra can't be separated from each other because they are quite equally but uh, with the fluorescent lifetime as a second information, we can uh, separate both dyes, the star red here in orange, the nuclear pore complex, and the star 635 here in green, the protein in the Golgi from each other. So, uh, the same cell, we stained uh, additionally the, with star orange and life 590, the DNA and a an, uh, second uh, protein in the Golgi. So both, again, can't be separated just by their uh, emission spectra, but because they have different lifetimes, we can separate uh, the star orange here in magenta and the life 590 DNA here in blue from each other. So with this, we can uh, easily create a four-color stat image. And now with a long stock dye, uh, which I have shown you a few slides before, we can add a fifth color to it with 460L actin, uh, with 460L phalloidin, we uh, were able to stain the actin uh, network in this fixed cell, here shown in yellow. And with a second uh, depletion laser, with a 495 depletion laser, we can uh, add an additional color to it. So the star green, we stained the vimentine with this dye uh, shown here in gray. To again show you a comparison of confocal and stat uh, image of the six color image, that's uh, the confocal in, uh, on the left side and the stat image on the right side. And you uh, really nicely can see the, the very good separated, uh, separation of all the six colors. And with this, I'm happy to take, after the talk of, of Elisa, um, your, your questions. So thanks for, for joining. Our guest for today is Elisa Deste, head of the core facility for optical microscopy at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg. Hey Elisa, glad to have you here. Thank you very much for the <coughs> invitation, Jasmin. You're welcome. So tell us about your research, short and in a nutshell. <laughs> Actually, what we are interested in is to visualize neuronal structures, and in particular the cytoskeleton of neurons, with the highest possible resolution, with a level of details that was never achieved before. And this gives us, of course, the possibility of making di new discoveries, of finding out new things. And in particular, what we are interested in is to analyze how the cytoskeleton mm. changes based on the activity of the cells. That sounds really interesting. So how did you get first interested in science and in particular in super resolution microscopy? So I'm coming from a family that has a quite strong scientific background mm -hmm. 
and therefore it was quite natural for me to be passionate about science and being a curious person. And then during the PhD, I started to work with microscopy techniques applied to neuroscience, and that's where I started to struggle with the resolution limit because mm -hmm. uh, on the confocal microscope that I was using, I couldn't see the structures that I wanted to mm -hmm. see with the details, that the level of detail that was uh, needed. Mm -hmm. And from there, actually, the journey into the field of super resolution started. Okay, so basically, we can say science runs through your bloodstream. A bit, yes. <laughs> okay, nice. So, um, tell us about your biggest uh, challenge you had in one of your research projects and how did you handle it? I would say that there is a major challenge that goes a bit across all the projects that we are running at the moment and that it is to always keep up with the enthusiasm for what you're doing and for the different projects. Because of course it's science, so there are many things that are working, but unfortunately also many things that are not working or many failures that you have to face and many samples that just do look ugly. And um, that's a big, biggest challenge, mm -hmm. but fortunately having the possibility of making microscopy, just seeing the image of a beautiful neuron on the screen, that always gives me at least a bit the passion and the motivation uh, to move on with the research that we are doing. Um, with yeah, even more motivation than before. <laughs> okay, so the recipe for your success is keep going and take pretty pictures. <laughs> yes, 100%. <laughs> okay, nice. So as you mentioned, you have many years uh, of experience using STAT microscopy. Tell us a bit how the technique uh, changed over these years. Mm -hmm. So by now I have been working for approximately 10 years mm -hmm. with that microscopy and I had the privilege of using one of the very first systems, custom built systems, mm -hmm. on which two color stat images could be acquired. Mm -hmm. And I clearly remember it that we had two different depletion lines to visualize the two uh, colors. We had to align the setup once if not twice mm -hmm. per day and to acquire a 20 times 20 micrometers field of view image, it was taking 36 minutes. And there was also no focus stabilization on the stage. This means that the sample very often was also drifting. If I think that now, in the same amount of time, we can acquire a four or five color image in a 60 times 60 mm -hmm. micrometers field of view on a commercial system with focus stabilization, and we might even be running the experiment from home, I guess that's really a big improvement. Yeah, cool. So we can say these machines evolve quite a bit. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So with that, we are now looking forward to your talk on multicolor strategies for stat nanoscopy. Elisa, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Yasmin. Today I would like to present you some strategies that we are using to perform multicolor stat nanoscopy. But first of all, I would like to explain you why it's important for us to perform multicolor imaging. The model system we are interested in are neuronal cultures, which are forming functional network and are interacted, interacting at the level of synapses, where we have an upstream cell that is sending the signal to a downstream cell. And the postsynaptic compartment in excitatory neurons is usually located on some small protrusions along the dendrites that are called dendritic spines. The size of synapses is only a few folds larger than the diffraction limit of light. And therefore, it's very important for us to use super resolution microscopy to visualize the fine details and organization of uh, synapses. Synapses are also very finely regulated. This means that the composition and the organization of these structures heavily depends on the activity, both of the neuronal cell and of the specific synapse. And therefore, if we want to understand how the structures are organized or whether they are present or not, uh, at synaptic level, it's important to, for us to be able to visualize in the structure of interest together with some markers that give us information on the status of that specific synapse. And this we can achieve with multicolor stat. When we are talking about multicolor imaging, it's important to distinguish two things that are the reporters and the targeting strategy. By reporters, I mean the molecules that we are ultimately visualizing with our microscopes which can be organic fluorophores or fluorescence fluorescent proteins. The targeting strategy, on the other hand, is the way in which we are bringing the fluorophore next to our structure of interest with a very high specificity. And by now there are several techniques and approaches that can be used. This is by far a not comprehensive list, 
but it's probably the ones that we are using the most and the most popular ones. So strategies that can be used for fixed cells, but not exclusively for fixed cells, are, for instance, the use of antibodies, in which we have a primary antibody that is targeting the structure of interest, and then we are using a secondary antibody um, that is recognizing the primary antibody uh, that is carrying the uh, reporters. We can use some affinity probes that are recognizing with high affinity our uh, target of interest. And affinity probes can be, for instance, nanobodies or affimers or DARPINs. Or we can have a click chemistry approach in which we are introducing an unnatural amino acid in the protein of interest. And then we are covalently binding the reporter to our protein of interest. Approaches that can be used for live cell imaging, but again, not exclusively for live cell imaging, are, for instance, the use of small molecule-based uh, probes in which we have our reporter that is conjugated to a small drug, a protein that can, uh, or a molecule that can recognize with very high specificity uh, the structure of interest. And examples of these probes are, for instance, host or seroactin. We can also use fluorescent proteins that we are uh, expressing in fusion with our uh, target protein, or we can use, for instance, self-labeling enzymes such as Halo tag or SNAP tag, which are expressing in fusion uh, with our protein of interest, similarly to what we would do with GFP. However, these enzymes, they are not fluorescent on their own, but we can add some substrates that are carrying a domain that is capable of recognizing the um, self-labeling enzymes with a very high specificity and the reporter molecule. Some of these approaches enable us to visualize uh, endogenous protein, um, while other approaches require the genetic manipulation uh, of, the, of our cells, of our system. What's important also to understand is that actually we can um, apply different reporters to different labeling strategies, and at the same time, different targeting strategies can, be, um, can benefit from the use of different uh, reporters. So we can mix and match a bit the, the reporters and the labeling strategies. And today I would like to first start talking about the targeting strategies that we are using. And I will in particular focus on the use of antibodies, of affinity probes, of small uh, molecules and self-labeling enzymes. Now starting uh, with the use of, uh, of reporters for fixed samples, um, the most common approach that is used and the most straightforward is the use of different antibodies uh, targeting different structures and having antibodies that are raised in different species. For instance, we can have primary antibodies case raised in rabbit, in mouse, or in guinea pig. And what we are doing in these cases is to first incubate our cells with a primary antibody raised in mouse and rabbit. Then we are using the secondary antibodies against these two species. And in a subsequent step, then we are using the antibody raised against guinea pig and its um, secondary antibody. And we are doing this labeling sequentially because we observe that sometimes there can be some cross-reactivity between the guinea pig and rabbit antibody, which we can minimize in this way. And here is an example of some hippocampal neurons in which we label to actin uh, binding proteins, adducine and uh, the branching protein R23 with antibodies raised against uh, in rabbit and in mouse. And then we had a synaptic marker, Homer, um, labeled using an antibody raised in guinea pig. Of course, now this approach is limited by the number of species um, that you can have in which the, uh, your primary antibodies are raised in, of uh, single domain antibodies or nanobodies. So if we have conventional immunoglobulins, are, uh, for instance, that we have in humans, are formed by a heavy chain and a light chain. The recognition of the antigen of the epitope is mediated by both the heavy chain and the light chain, and the heavy chain uh, is composed by three um, constant regions. The antibodies that are present in camelids and in alpacas, for instance, actually have a different structure, and in particular, they are lack lacking the, uh, the light chain, and they are formed only by the heavy chain. That therefore, it's the only uh, part of the protein that is responsible for recognizing the antigen. Furthermore, they have only two um, constant regions, not three. This means that actually we can isolate this fragment that is responsible for the recognition uh, of the target, and actually we can even produce it uh, in vitro um, as a recombinant protein. 
Now, an advantage uh, of using only this fragment uh, to label the structure of interest is also that this so-called nanobody or single domain antibodies is monovalent. So you have just one nanobody th that can bind uh, one protein of interest. And uh, therefore, there is no risk of cross-linking different proteins. Uh, that is something that can happen actually when you're using uh, antibody due to their bivalent nature. Now, how can we use nanobodies to perform multicolor imaging? Actually, what we are doing is to use uh, so-called secondary nanobodies, meaning some nanobodies that have been raised against some constant regions of primary antibody raised in different species. And what we can do is to pre-incubate, pre-coupled a primary antibody with a corresponding uh, nanobody, and then we are adding to our fixed cells the already premixed complex of primary and secondary antibody. And of course, we can incubate into different tubes, different primary antibodies uh, with different secondary uh, nanobodies that we can then use in parallel uh, on our sample. And this is an example of an image that has been obtained using this approach in which we use two uh, primary antibodies raised in rabbit that have been pre-coupled with different um, secondary nanobody and nanobodies. And here we are seeing in particular an actin binding protein again, adocene and the synaptic protein, uh, synaptic marker Homer, and you can really appreciate how there is no uh, crosstalk between the structures of interest. One caveat of this approach, however, is that uh, we need to use ideally antibodies that are uh, purified and that do not contain BSA to maximize the affinity and the pre-coupling of the nanobody to the uh, primary antibody. Now, having discussed a bit some strategies that we can use uh, to perform multicolor imaging in fixed cells, I would like to present you some ways in which we can make, we can uh, target different targets in live cells. And in particular, um, I would like to, to present you how we are using, in, we can use in parallel some small molecule uh, based probes and self labeling enzymes. One important thing, however, that we have to keep in mind if we want to make live imaging is also that we need to use some probes that are non-toxic uh, for the cells. They should be membrane permeable, meaning that they can uh, penetrate through the membrane and reach their target. And ideally, they should be fluorogenic, meaning that when they are not bound to the structure of interest, they should be in a dark state and only upon binding, they should uh, emit fluorescence. And in this way, we can achieve a high signal to noise ratio. So how can we use this uh, protein simultaneously or this uh, targeting strategy simultaneously? Actually, what we can do is that we can have our protein of interest that is expressed in the cells in fusion with halo tag. And we can simply incubate then the cells with a halo tag substrate and simultaneously with a small molecule that is binding other structures of interest. And by now we have several probes um, that are available, targeting in particular, for instance, microtubule, actin, DNA, mitochondria, or lysosomes, but there are uh, many more out there. And uh, simply after incubating then the cells with the halotex substrate and our, the other small probes, we can directly image the samples. And here are some examples from a recent publication in which we labeled in the same uh, cells both Fementin that was uh, expressed in fusion with a halo tag and uh, tubulin and dactin that were labeled with some small uh, probes uh, targeting indeed tubulin and actin. And here is an, another example in which we have fementin uh, labeled together with um, DNA. That was another video, okay. Just to show you that uh, we can also make then uh, live imaging and see the dynamics of these structures. Now, having discussed a bit the different targeting strategies that we can use, uh, I would like now to focus on the different reporters that we can use and combine with these labeling strategies. And in particular, I would like to focus on three strategies uh, that we are using, uh, that are the use of spectrally separated dyes, the use of long stow shift dyes, and of photoactivatable dyes. Now, starting with the spectrally separated dyes, that is probably the most straightforward approach, here, we can use different dyes that have different excitation, um, uh, that can be excited at different wavelengths and have different excite uh, detection windows. 
Uh, for instance, we can use star 635 or star 635P, star 580 or Alexa 594, and star green or Alexa 488. Now, what we can do in this, if we want to image these dyes, is that we can first image uh, the red and the orange dye, which we can both set with a 775 line, and um, we have to image them on two separate detectors in a semi-simultaneous um, semi way, meaning that we should have the, a sequential line scan to minimize the bleed through in between the channels. And afterwards, we can excite or we can visualize the green dye that then we are exciting with a 488 um, excitation line and we are depleting with a seven, 595 stead line. Um, now, a drawback of this approach is that actually you can acquire only one image. Indeed, in the moment in which you're uh, imaging the green dye and you're using the 595 depletion beam, you will also bleach the red and the orange dye. However, uh, on the other hand, here we have then the possibility of also adding a fourth channel that we can image, for instance, in confocal, uh, with a dye that we can excite with a 405 line, such as Alexa 405 or TAPI. And here is an example of an image that we uh, acquired using this configuration, in which we have uh, two proteins, ergic component of the secretory pathway, and the synaptic marker homer that are labeled with primary and secondary antibodies raised in different species. We have a um, um, presynaptic marker that is labeled with a nanobody and actin that is labeled with a small molecule. Now, what I would like also to mention and to stress that when you're making, performing this kind of multicolor experiments, it's also very important to always image the red channels and then move to the green and the blue channels to minimize also the bleaching of the structure that you want to uh, image. This approach can also be applied to living cells. And here is an example in which we uh, perform this tricolor uh, stat imaging of Vimentin uh, with coupled to a dye, a halo tag dye in the green regime and actin and tubulin with dyes that could be excited at 640 and 560 uh, nanometers. Now, a drawback of this approach is that to perform this three-color imaging, actually, we need two different stat lines, and we also need three different uh, detectors. And the way in which we can overcome this limitation, we can be able to perform three-color imaging with a single stat line, is by using long stove shift dyes. So long stove shift dyes are dyes in which we have the excitation and the uh, emission spectrum that are separated by several tens, if not hundreds of nanometers. This means, this is for instance the example of ATO 490 long stow shift, can be excited at 488 nanometers and is emitting in the red uh, spectrum. This means that actually we can image this dye together with a conventional red dye, such as star 635P. And indeed, both dyes can be stead with a 775 depletion line, can be imaged with the same detector, and we can differentiate them based on their excitation. Basically, we can then uh, image them semi-simultaneously again by just applying uh, sequential line scans. Since in this configuration we are using only two excitation lines, we still have the space for adding a third channel for a dye such as star 580 that we can excite with a 560 line and then we are detecting on a second dedicated detector. Here, however, uh, we have to take care of the fact that there can be some bleed through of the signal uh, between the, in particular, the, the long stow shift and the orange dye. And this bleed through can be minimized or reduced by applying a mixing or simply by carefully selecting uh, which reporter you're using for which structure of interest. And here is an example uh, of an image in which we use this approach from a publication of some years ago, in which we used, uh, again, a synaptic marker and actin binding proteins that were labeled with primary and secondary antibodies. And then we labeled actin with a small uh, probe phalloidin. This approach can be used or can be applied also to live cell imaging, since nowadays we have also some long stow shift dyes that are membrane permeable and therefore can be used in living cells. And here is an example um, in which we use a long stow shift dye that is very similar to live 460, long stow shift that was targeting mitochondria that is displayed here in magenta, together with probes that are targeting 
pectin and microtubules, and that are uh, small molecule based. In this case, actually, we could even add the fourth channel to our imaging scheme uh, in the 488 channel. And here we used actually a primary antibody, a primary secondary antibody labeling, since we were using an antibody that is recognizing an extracellular epitope that is expressed only uh, on one part of the axon in neurons. And we could record then this fourth channel uh, in, a, in a second step uh, compared to the imaging on, of all the first three dyes. So I showed you how using long stowship dyes, actually we can image uh, three colors simultaneously in stat modality and even a fourth channel in confocal mode. However, if we want to add further channels, now we are a bit uh, limited and uh, it starts to get a bit complicated. And the strategy that we use to implement even more channels to our imaging scheme is the use of photoactivatable dyes. So photoactivatable dyes are dyes in which we have a protecting group that is preventing the fluorescence. And this pho protecting group is photocleavable, meaning that upon irradiation with UV light, uh, this protecting group is removed and the molecule is, uh, can fluoresce. Now, how can we use or can we benefit from these dyes from performing multicolor imaging? Actually, what we can do is that we can use um, a photoactivatable dye together with a dye, with a conventional dye, even if they have very similar uh, emission and excitation spectrum. For instance, uh, we can use uh, star 635 that we can uh, excite and deplete with a conventional window uh, or scheme, so 640 excitation, 775 depletion beam. Then we can bleach uh, this dye, and this we can do very effectively by using, for instance, the stat beam at 595. And then we are uncaging the compound that was in a dark state with a 405 light. And lastly, we can image this cage compound using uh, the exact uh, scheme that we use for the 640, uh, the conventional dye in the 640. Now, since now we are using just one single, uh, excitation line and detection window, actually we can relatively easily add the second uh, dye that is a conventional dye in the orange and it's also another cage compound also in the orange. And we can image semi-simultaneously again the conventional dyes and the cage compounds. However, we can also actually take benefit from the fact that we have a bleaching step and uncaging steps in which we are using the 595 stat line and the 405 line to add further channels that we can image uh, during these steps. And in particular, we can use a green dye uh, that can be stat at with a 595 line, such as Alexa uh, 405, uh, 488, and a dye that can be excited at 405 that we can image during the uncaging step. And here is an example of an image that we obtained using this approach in which we could image um, five colors in, in stat modality and one color in confocal. And here what we have, we have a presynaptic structures um, that are labeled with gluten bassoon, that are labeled with nanobodies and primary secondary uh, antibodies respectively. And then we have some components of the excitatory and inhibitory uh, postsynaptic sites that are labeled again with conventional primary and secondary antibodies. And then we have actin labeled with a phalloidin, therefore a small molecule, and spectrin, which uh, was labeled with pre-coupling of the primary antibody with a secondary nan nanobody. And here you can see that actually we can visualize now all these six colors in the image, and there is no crosstalk or bleed through uh, between the structures that are clearly uh, separated. Now, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that actually it's important for us being able to perform multicolor imaging to be able to, to visualize uh, proteins of interest within the context of the synaptic status. And this is something that we did uh, recently in a project in which we were interested in visualizing the presence and the abundance of some components of the secretory pathway at the postsynapse. So the secretory pathway is the pathway that leads protein uh, that are being secreted or uh, inserted to the membrane, to their uh, target, uh, to their destination. And in particular, we looked at uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, the, the ergic compartment, so the 
ER to Golgi intermediate compartment and the trans Golgi network. And we looked at these proteins together with some markers of the synaptic status and in particular of the synaptic strength and of the synaptic uh, activity. And what we observed and we noticed that is while the synaptic strength influences the abundance of these components of the secretory pathway that is present at the postsynaptic level, the presynaptic activity influences the region from which they are recruited, meaning that we have uh, synaptic sites in which we have more activity, the components are recruited from a larger area. And this might be a mechanism through which the cells are uh, readily responding to changes in the activity. And with this, I'm at the end of the presentation, I, and I would like to thank uh, many people who supported and work on uh, the, the projects I've showed you today, in particular from at the Max Planck for Medical Research in Heidelberg in the group of optical nanoscopy and chemical uh, biology, and at the Max Planck for Multidisciplinary Science in the Department of Nanobiophotonics. And also a special thank goes to uh, the chemists who worked on the development of many of the probes and really pioneered uh, the development of probes for uh, multicolor state imaging, and in particular, Alex Putkevich, Grachvidas, Lukinavichus, and uh, Lu Wang. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Elisa, and thank you, Florian, for your presentations. I believe we all have learned a lot. With that, I would like to thank everyone for watching and hope you enjoyed the session. We will now switch to the live mode. So we are now live and welcome to the Q&A session. Um, let me check if everything is working. So Elisa, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, I can also hear you. <laughs> and Florian, can you hear me? Perfectly. Perfect. Good, then um, I will start with the first question, which goes to Elisa. So if you're starting um, with multicolor stat imaging, uh, which approach or system would you recommend um, to start with? <laughs> yeah, so first of all, I would recommend the people to consider if you, how many colors you really need to have super resolved and or how many structures you really need to obtain the enhancement in resolution that is required for stat. Because in many cases, you might have some structures that you're imaging that maybe you have just as a reference and visualizing them in confocal is sufficient. And of course, having just maybe two colors that and one confocal makes a huge difference or makes things much more easy than having three colors that. Uh, given this, uh, definitely for two colors that experiments, I would go uh, at least on, considering that also the majority of the instruments, they have at least different detectors. I would go for two spectrally separated detectors because you can get an immediate um, image that maybe doesn't require also some prior knowledge regarding the lifetime of the fluorophores on which we can be relatively sure regarding the separation and the signal that you're getting. And for the third channel, I would still uh, recommend if two stat lines are available to use to combine then the two orange and red dye with a green dye. In the case then in which this is suboptimal, because maybe multiple images have to be acquired, then uh, I guess that the thing that can be implemented more readily, also considering the tools that have been developed uh, and also commercialized in the last years, uh, would be to use then the long slow shift dots. But for them, also a bit of a mixing might be required, and also a bit finer tuning of the labeling procedures is needed. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Florian, um, which of the barrier life dyes uh, can be used both in living cells and also in fixed cells? For example, um, if you're performing live cell imaging um, and then you would like to fix the cells and um, yeah, the text will still, can still be imaged afterwards. <laughs> Um, so we, um, right now we offer uh, four different probes. So uh, one for tubulin, for actin and for DNA staining. So that's our direct uh, um, labels and then for SnapTag. And um, so you can use uh, DNA, actin and SnapTag um, um, probes 
uh, to <clears throat> first stain your target and then fix the cell, or you can also first fix your cell uh, and then stain it afterwards. So that's um, uh, uh, that's possible for this three um, probes. Um, tubulin you can only use for for living cells. Uh, so we would recommend only use tubulin for for your living living cells. Um, yeah. So actually, in in with this three uh, probes, so actin, DNA, and SNAP, uh, SNAPTEC uh, probes, you can use it for fixed and living cells. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so another question is, uh, uh, someone wants to know if pro post processing uh, is needed for multicolor stat imaging. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so it really depends on the strategies that you are using and um, yes, it, it depends on the strategies. So uh, in general, um, for instance, if you are acquiring or you're using an approach that requires a frame-wise uh, acquisition, so that let's say you're acquiring, for instance, the red and orange channels first in a first frame and afterwards the um, green channel, you might have to apply some um, registration to correct for the drift of the sample if that uh, is present. So usually, for instance, what we are doing, we are also when we are acquiring the red and uh, orange channel, we are also always acquiring in confocal already the green channel that then we can use to register and align the images when we are then acquiring the, the stat image with the 595 stat beam. Um, if you're using the 405 laser uh, for confocal imaging, there might be some corrections for chromatic aberrations that has to be performed. And of course, if you're using long stow shift dyes, there some unmixing might be required, but that really heavily depends um, on the structures that you're visualizing uh, and also on the detections that uh, you're using and if you can finely tune the, the detections. Um, that's why I also kind of stressed um, in the presentation that you really have to carefully choose which structure is labeled uh, with what. I would recommend to make some tests uh, because there are some combinations in which you might have higher bleed through that then require some spectral mixing, while in other cases you might not even have to make spectral mixing because maybe you have a protein or a structure that is dimmer and then you don't see it in the other channels. Uh, but that are all the, the corrections that we are making um, afterwards. And for instance, for the um, um, five plus one color stat image um, that I showed with the caged dyes, there it's purely the registration for the drift of the sample that was uh, applied, applied. And there, there was really no need of spectral unmixing. So in case that can also be uh, a combination that doesn't have basically any bleed through between the channels. But always try to, if you really want to see co-localization between structures, try to have them in two channels in which you know that you have the least uh, bleed through. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So maybe you can also answer the next question. Um, can, can I achieve the same resolution in all channels, channels that I'm recording? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> in principle, yes, and that would be really great. Uh, in practice, in particular, if you can tune, if you have the possibility of tuning the laser power for the specific um, dyes. Mm -hmm. um, however, in practice, it is still the case that the best resolution is achieved for the dyes that are in the 640 uh, channel. So the rightmost dyes, because you have a higher uh, cross-section and also usually they are dyes that have better performances and they are most stable. Um, so if you're designing a multicolor experiment, that is also one of the important things to keep in mind. Try to have the structure for which you want to have the best resolution in the rightmost channel. Okay, thank you. So Florian, the next question is for you. Um, to what extent must the lifetime be uh, different of the dyes uh, in order to separate them? Mm, so usually it's fine if the if the dyes have uh, like 0 0.5 nanoseconds uh, differences in lifetime. Um, that's fine enough. Um, it's always better to have a, a 
yeah, greater distance, like one nanoseconds or even more, but uh, 0 0.5 nanoseconds would be also um, uh, fine to start with, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, and uh, in your presentation, Florian, you showed us a beautiful uh, six color image. Um, is it possible to have even more colors than six for um, stat microscopy? Well, um, yes, it is possible, but um, I mean, from the from the um, technical side, there's no problem. I mean, if you look to the to the microscope, you have your uh, three or four uh, detectors, and then you can separate also uh, your dyes by um, um, by your fluorescent signal or the, the emission spectra, and by the lifetime. Um, and uh, also from the from the number of dyes which are available, of course, you have a lot of dyes which you can use. Um, we are mainly limited by the labeling strategy. So um, as Elisa already said, um, you have, um, for example, anti uh, antibodies or nanobodies, uh, but then you're running quite quickly out of, um, um, of your species you can use. So then you have to use another strategy like snap tag or, or uh, direct labeling for actin, tubulin, whatever. And there are also other um, strategies available like click uh, chemistry, click labeling. Um, so that is something we also are um, um, trying to, to offer soon. So we will launch also those click probes um, having having an addition, um, additional um, um, labeling strategy, so that is actually the main or the crucial crucial part here: uh, finding the best labeling strategies to get everything uh, nicely together, having a seven or eight color stat image. So in theory, it would be possible, but uh, yeah, um, the right uh, strategy uh, is needed for for it. Okay, thank you. So. Um, Another question was if uh, we record the session and yes, also the Q&A session will be recorded and will be uploaded um, within the next days on our webpage. So if you missed uh, some parts of our webinar or you had any problems with the audio, you can still download it um, and watch it again. So with this, um, Thank you for watching and thank you for your questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you, Florian, and thank you, Elisa. Um, stay all healthy and see you at our next webinar. <laughs> so take care. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Bye. Bye. Bye.